Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Let me ring the bell for the first time ever. Oh, that's not how you do it. <laughs> I think it's broken. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to the Rotary Club of San Francisco. We are the second oldest Rotary Club in the world. Thank you so much for being here today. With the classification of financial advisor, I'm your host for today, Sunny Singh. And where is President Mary Lou? Actually, hold on, give me one second. I am. President Mary Lou is in Houston for the Rotary International Convention. She's been uh, really helpful in helping me getting ready for today's meeting. So thank you, Mary. Just a reminder, uh, masks are not required. However, they are strongly encouraged while inside and when not eating, but not required. Today's agenda, we're going to welcome the guests and the visiting Rotarians. We're going to share some good news, 20 for 20. We're going to talk about the upcoming events. And trust me, June is a fun, busy month for us. We'll go over some of the past events in the last week. We'll, have, we'll do a table talk if we have time, and then we'll get to hear from our amazing speaker, Mr. Barry Posner. And we we'll, hopefully, uh, President Mary will be able to join us streaming live from the RI convention. We do have past President JT joining us from Houston right now, and he's having a great time. So we're going to welcome our guests and visiting Rotarians. Um, I know we have some guests today who would like, I know Mr. Uh, do we have some guests? Yeah. We, 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 do we have any guests? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, we'll, 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 any guests? Oh, this. Any other guests? Any guests? Yeah. Okay, okay. So I, I have two guests here. Uh, this is John Ferguson and Amr Selim. And uh, they are, uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves really quickly, but they're responsible for taking me to uh, Cairo, Lebanon, uh, sorry, Cairo, Beirut, and uh, uh, Erbil in, in, in Kurdistan. So uh, here you are, John. Okay. Uh, John Ferguson. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I received 41 years ago a Rotary Graduate Scholarship, which has led to a very international career as a pianist, been to 150 countries, visited many Rotary clubs, and started an organization called American Voices, which leads me to Amr Salim here, who works with me at American Voices. He'll tell you a bit more. Hello, everyone. My name is Amr Salim. I'm originally from Cairo, Egypt. I live in San Jose with my wife and two little girls. I play the French horn. Um, I went to school playing the horn from the age of 10 all the way until I graduated with my doctorate from New York. Now I'm the director of international music programs at American Voices, amongst other things. And uh, one of the things that we're really proud of is taking American faculty, like Andres, very high quality teachers uh, on the road to go teach uh, young musicians and artists in Africa and the Middle East. So this summer, uh, we have uh, about eight different programs in uh, Uganda, Nigeria, Bangladesh, India, Egypt, Lebanon, Kurdistan, and probably forgot a few. And um, yeah, so we're teaching Broadway, songwriting, hip hop, all of these things. Also orchestra, wind ensemble, and the classical uh, repertoire. This is my first treasury lunch, so thank you so much, Andres, for the invitation, and I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. And we have? Um, I have a guest, uh, Sam Eriksmoen. Uh, we can talk Norwegian if you want, cause, because we grew up in North Dakota, you know? And uh, <laughs> um, so Sam uh, has made it all the way from North Dakota to here. Uh, he has a long uh, history in his family of Rotary. We haven't been able to persuade him to join yet, but, but we're going to because he lives only a few blocks from here. So uh, he's out here now. He's a successful uh, techie. Do you want to say anything? Sure. Yeah, thank you for uh, for hosting this. And it's a pleasure to have uh, Barry Posner here as someone that I look up to. And um, I had the pleasure of learning the five practices of exemplary leadership uh, in college and then facilitated a program. And it, it's been a life-changing methodology for me. So um, truly a, a pleasure to be here and an honor to get to join you all. So thank you.
Okay, welcome. We have one more. Anita. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Mary Fermi to you, and this is her last time that she's going to be here as a guest. Uh, she's joining Rotary next week and will be inducted. And Mary, would you like to say anything? That's all right. Okay. <laughs> She says, that's all right, huh? Okay. All right, we have Mr. Dan, Jordan's dad. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. Always a pleasure to be here for Rotary on Tuesdays, and it's a pleasure as well to have our neighbor. Carol, please stand. Uh, Carol Ito is our neighbor, and I just wanted to get clear on all the many things that she has done. I know her primarily because she's a very active politician in our neighborhood. She's a political uh, uh, maker. She helps support candidates. But the things that she's done in her life include everything from uh, repping uh, uh, lines of toys to being uh, a social worker to being on the airport commission for, I think, 10 years, 12 years, uh, to being on the commission for women and reigniting that. Now, that's a current effort. No, that's a past effort. But uh, if you want to talk politics, Carol's the one, and we're so glad you're here. Thank you. You want to say something? Yes, um, thank you, Bob and Dan are my neighbors. We've been neighbors for a number of years. Uh, I am American born, I'm not um, from Japan, but um, I'm third generation Japanese American. And I hope you all voted, those of you residents, today's voting day here, June 7th, and I hope you all, we have until eight o'clock tonight to vote. So please cast your ballot, it's really important. But I appreciate the invitation today. Um, I've attended a few of your events uh, in Bob and Dan's home. I have a friend who was president of Rotary of Chinatown, uh, Benita Louie, and I've been invited to uh, several events that they've been involved with and projects. They've been, I've actually worked on some projects with the Chinatown Rotary, so thank you for your invitation. And then I just want to encourage our visitors, maybe from Bangalore to start with, we've got visiting Rotarians. Can I pass the microphone over for them? Absolutely. Here you go, sir. Yeah. Um, okay, good afternoon, friends, Rotarians. Uh, I'm from uh, Bangalore, India. Um, not sure how many of you have heard of Bangalore, but yeah, but it's, it's a silicon city of India. Anyways, um, so I've been a, a president last year, so I'm the immediate past president of my club. And uh, so I was visiting here, and whenever, wherever I visit, you know, I do make it a point to, uh, to attend a Rotary meeting. I, I, I keep going to Toronto very often, so... I always visit uh, uh, a Rotary meeting. Um, so just to sort of, you know, I know that you guys are short of time, but uh, just to very quickly know that, you know, we are one of the most active clubs in, um, um, in, in our district 3190. Over the past three years, we have, um, we have spent about uh, close to $5 million in doing various uh, activities. And uh, including last year, in my year, we spent about $700,000 doing various community services. Anyways, I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, so thank you so much for, for having us over here. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Beal from the Rotary Club of Dallas. I know <laughs> conventions in Texas and I'm in California, but I'm in town for work and uh, excited to be uh, welcomed by your club and excited to hear uh, you're a great speaker. So thank you for having me. Quick question, Ryan. Since you're from Dallas, are you a 49ers fan too? I am not, but I'm, I'm originally from, I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio, where the York family is from. So All right. sort of cheer for them when Love they're not it. playing my Cleveland Browns. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Scott or Lisa, do we have any guests on Zoom today? Oh, okay. You, you want to Change that with him after. Yeah. We'll do the flag exchange next. Just one second. Oh, you want to do the flag exchange now? Uh, we're going to see if there's any guests online okay. first. Harmony, are you a guest or are you a member? I've lost track. I'm not a member, but I don't think I'm a guest anymore. <laughs> Harmony, yes, she is. She's not a guest anymore. She's part of the family. All right. Um, I know Narimza, if I hope I didn't mispronounce that. We're going to do a quick flag exchange. Please come on up.
Bill, would you do the honors for us? Thank you. It's up to you wherever you want to stand here. That's awesome. We get to do two flag exchanges today. All right, uh, let's do a big round of applause for all our visiting Rotarians and our guests. Thank you so much for being here today. As we know, this meeting is not possible without our amazing volunteers for the day. So a big thank you goes out to Bob Herman for registration, Jeff Lerner to be our scribe for the day, Ozan Yasavor for the, as a photographer for the day. I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Please correct me if I did. Jim Patrick is the mic holder for the day, David Dye and Alicia Marfadi are the greeters for the day. And I believe Scott Plakin and Lisa Christian are our Zoom hosts. So thank you so much for making this happen. And also a big thank you to Jesse, as always, for taking care of all the hard stuff. <laughs> all right, so today's quote of the day, as you see on the screen, was picked by Ma Mary, our president. And we thought it would be a great idea to share one of, uh, have one of our own outstanding artists, a musician, Andres Vera, come up and read the quote and tell us what it means to him. So thank you so much. Uh, the quote is, art is the one place we all turn to for solace. Uh, Carrie Mae Weems is a African-American artist uh, here in, San uh, sorry, I, I, I'm not sure where she lives, but she focuses on the, uh, where uh, the sort of the, how African American women are not represented in society and are, uh, do not get as many resources as uh, the rest of society. So she focuses her art on those things. And I find it such an interesting uh, quote uh, because even though we all turn, uh, apparently we all turn to it for solace, art in San Francisco is still struggling. And we have to, as a community, you know, really, really try to make it easier for artists to access resources and uh, to be paid the amount that artists need to be paid. You know, as a performing cellist, you know, I, I've been playing the cello since I was seven years old. I play the cello better than some doctors do their jobs. So it's really, it's re some, so really, and I'm, I'm amazed at our, uh, doctors who, who get away with some of the things that they are, uh, that they do. So, uh, you know, this is very interesting. Let us continue turning to Art for Solace, but not forget that there's still a lot of work to be done. So thank you so much. Thank you, Andres. That's awesome. All right, next. So one of our new members, Ozan, has completed all of his red badge activities. That was really fast, Ozan. Congratulations. Come on up. And uh, just for all the guests in the room, I'll say uh, a red badge is a, a badge that we give to our new members when they join as a form of uh, trying to get them engaged in the club activities. So Ozan, I think, just joined a few months ago and he's already completed all the activities. So thank you so much, Ozan. Congratulations. Let's have the badge off here. Let's do it. Oh, actually, hold on. Let's uh, get a photographer because oh, oh. Ozan is the photographer for the day. This committee, he joined the art cap. And uh, you were a Rotarian before. Yeah. And what was that again? Uh, I did the Rotarian course. And in, in Turkey, yeah, you did technology, mechanical engineer. Here we go. Are you ready? Here you go. Okay. Do you want to say anything for us? 
thank you for uh, being so supportive to me. And also, I would like to thank the Dan. He's my mentor. He's not in here, but I would like to thank you all. Thank you. That's Dan Davies. Here we yeah. go. One, two, three. Wow. Oh, 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 oh. How many of you in the room know who Chongar is? Yeah, yeah Chongar joined our uh, club about a year and a half to two years ago. And, um, you know, Chongar and his wife Jenny welcomed their first child into their family. And he was very excited to share this news with us. Uh, baby Klaus and Mama Jenny are doing great. I spoke to Chongar and he plans on attending a meeting via Zoom sometime in July and sharing his new experience with us. So please reach out to him if you're in contact. All right, let's keep, get the, keep the good news rolling. So this is 20 for 20. Share your good news for $20 for 20 seconds. Anyone here has some good news to share? Don't be shy, come on. Good news coming. I am really happy to, so as many, many of you might know, I, I also have another job at an organization that improves the quality of knowledge on Wikipedia. And we, I, well, I uh, was able to raise more than $10,000 to increase the, uh, the amount of LGBTQ knowledge that is on Wikipedia. So increasing the representation of gay people who are represented on Wikipedia. Simultaneously also teaching those students who are taking this course how to fight misinformation. So uh, I believe misinformation is uh, the number one threat to our democracy. And so I'm doing all my best to solve that. So thank you, that's my good news. More than $10,000. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. All right, let's keep it going. So let's go over our upcoming Rotary events. Uh, like I said, June's a busy month for us. We have a lot of fun events coming up. Uh, first, I would like to see if Harmony on Zoom would like to do a quick introduction to this project for Alps Book Drive. And Hi there, my name is Mira Pause Hong. The video, sorry. I am part of a team leading the Bay Area. Well, okay, Harmony, the floor is all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sunny. Um, I am really excited to introduce this team to you. They have been working for probably about five or six weeks now to address literacy and access to education through a series of book drives and an engaging event with a local elementary school in their area. Um, and I don't think I have to say much more. The students have prepared a video. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it live today, um, but they do a good overview of what they're doing, what they're trying to accomplish. And then they have an ask for everyone here today. So. Um, here is Mebo. Hi there, my name is Mirabel Huang. I am part of a team leading the Bay Area Book Drive. Our goal is to collect books from around San Francisco and redistribute them to underprivileged or underserved schools in the Bay Area. So I'm reaching out to you guys because we need your help. We need your help to spread the word, um, collect donations, and possibly find more donation sites. So first, if you or anyone you know is interested in um, sending us books, that would be amazing. We could use any spare books for children in lower school or middle school. Um, donation, donation sites such as in various stores or parks in San Francisco are linked in our website and the flyer. Um, and then if you or anyone you know owns a small business or area in San Francisco that would be open to us putting our donation bins there, please reach out to us. Um, we have linked our Instagram and um, our website, so if you could contact us about that, that would be great. If not, just spreading the word about this initiative, this drive, or even donating your own books to these sites would be so helpful. Thank you, I appreciate it, and I hope you have a great day. 
All right. Thank you. Our next event is with the Homeless Prenatal Project. It's actually uh, tonight at 5.30 p.m. Uh, we'll be you know, bagging baby clothes, towels, health kits, hats, and other items for the clients of Homeless Prenatal Project. You can register at sfrotary.com, and the event's held at the HPP headquarters on 18th Street. Okay, this is a big event for us. Uh, June 11th, this Saturday, the club picnic. I have a lot to say about this event. Uh, we have about 46 people registered so far, and the objective of this picnic is to celebrate Mary Lou's year. So I would love for you to sign up if you haven't registered yet. I would highly recommend you register today. Um, all members and families and their guests are welcome. We will be serving sausages, burgers, pre-cooked ribs, veggie burgers, beer, wine, and water. And for the water, let's uh, reduce the waste. So if you have a reusable water bottle, please bring it with water. We will have some other you know, plastic water bottles from Costco, but I would love for us to reduce the waste as much as possible. And Stacy Poole is uh, part of the committee helping us plan the picnic. And she did send out an email to you uh, if you had registered to organize the potluck sign up for this picnic. Um, if you haven't gone back to her yet, please see Stacy after today's meeting and let her know what you're bringing. We really appreciate that. And bring any folding lawn chairs if you have any, uh, just one or two if you have it, pic picnic blankets. And I also need two volunteers for um, ice chest. If anyone has an ice chest at home and they're coming to the picnic, can you please raise your hand if you can bring it? Okay, awesome. Thank you, Bob. Okay, I'll bring another one. We're okay. I also need volunteers to possibly meet me there at 10 a.m. instead of 11 to help me unload the supplies from Costco, stuff like the burgers and the beer and the wine. Is there anyone able to come a little bit early and help me out at 10 a.m.? Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Bill, appreciate it. Awesome. So once again, uh, let's talk about the location for the picnic, because I know it's in Golden Gate Park and uh, it's a big part, so it can be overwhelming at times. So when you uh, try to come early, obviously the earlier you come, easier it will be to find parking, uh, use carpool or you know Uber. But if you drive just on Google Maps, just type in Hellman Hollow, and it'll take you to the JFK side of that location. That part of JFK Drive is open. I've confirmed that. And that's the closest location as far as walking to our picnic area, which was Hellman Hollow tables one through four. If you type in Hellman Hollow picnic area in Google Maps, it's going to take you on the other side of that location and you'll have a little bit of a longer walk. So please enter just Hellman Hollow in Google Maps and it'll take you to the JFK side of the uh, picnic area. There's a lot of street parking on that JFK on the side. If you have any questions, uh, I'd recommend you reach out to me before Saturday, please. Thank you. All right, so next Tuesday, we have our Rotary Lunch meeting here, and it's a big, big meeting because we're gonna go over our year-end recognition and award ceremony that we won as a club at the District 5150 conference. So that'll be an amazing event. Please come. If you haven't registered, please do, and we'll have a great time. Mary Lou is very excited about this meeting, so let's support her. Another project, uh, the registration for this project is closed, but this one's on June 16th. Uh, this is where we actually distribute the diaper bags and serve food and help with games for the homeless prenatal project. As you know, if you're new to Rotary or just want to connect with other Rotarians in a casual setting, a President Mary Lou will be hosting a coffee and conversation event at Phil's Coffee on Friday, June 17th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. And it's just an opportunity for new members to get to know more about the club and how you can get involved in other club activities and fellowship. June 18th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., we're going to have an event in Oakland at the Pacific Renaissance Plaza. And this is an opportunity to distribute safety alarms to Asian seniors. 
Volunteers are needed to distribute personal safety alarms to 300 Asian seniors. And this is in collaboration with the Rotary Club of San Francisco Chinatown, Rotary Club of Oakland, Asians United, Oakland Chinese Chamber of Commerce, Oakland Police Department, and the FBI Special Task Force Against Asian Hate. And the task involves just distributing alarms, uh, going over the instructions. And if you, if you speak any of these following languages, or if you know someone who does, uh, there is a need for them, so please bring them. If they speak Cantonese, Toisan, or Mandarin, that would be helpful. But you do not need to speak any of those languages to be a volunteer. Another project, June 20th, uh, is the ARC of San Francisco, and we need drivers that can pick up prepackaged meals from the ARC and deliver it to the individual residences of the participants who are experiencing food insecurity. And I know we do need more people to volunteer for this project. Exact directions will be provided when you pick up the meals. Uh, hand delivery of the meals must occur between 4 p.m. and 5.30 p.m in advance of the Monday night dinner club that they have with friends like me via Zoom, which is held on the first and the third Monday of each month. All right, so this is another big event for June on June 21st. As the Rotary year is coming to a close, it is time to celebrate and thank President Mary. So President-elect nominee, me, Sunny Singh, I'll get to host this special recognition and a roast of our amazing President Mary. So please sign up. Uh, if you haven't, this in the past we've called this the debunking meeting, but we're not calling that calling it that anymore. We're just gonna call it a celebration. Um, if you have pictures of Mary, any funny stories, memorable moments uh, with her, you know, please reach out to me and share those things so we can add those uh, pictures and moments to the celebration. Any questions? Good. Okay, so next we're gonna talk, talk about Ryla. So we're, Ryla is back live in person coming up in August, August 3rd till the 7th. Lynn, would you like to talk about Ryla? We have a very exciting Ryla planned. Uh, we have shifted from a three-day event in April when uh, students are way too busy to uh, the, a five-day event the first week of August. So they learn uh, team building skills. We typically have 150 to 200 students from 35 different high schools across our three counties. By expanding to five days, we're able to do more uh, workshops. Leadership is always are often done in the context of, of some real issue that, that people face. On the applications, we ask students, what are the most pressing issues that you see in your community? And then secondly, which one is your priority? And as you might imagine, the, the number one, 50% of the students said climate and climate change will have a workshop for them on the kinds of things that they can do in their local community or assisting globally around climate change. Food insecurity, homelessness, mental health, uh, these are all the issues that uh, surface. Um, will be, um, it's, it's the third through the seventh of August. Um, there'll be an opportunity for some of you to visit camp. Uh, we're not sure which day it will be but you can uh, come down. We currently have a full complement of facilitators. We uh, divide the students into groups of 10 uh, with no student from the same school in that team. So they, they begin to bond and we have two facilitators uh, with each. So we have a full complement of uh, facilitators now and a full, uh, full uh, staff. But there will be opportunities for you to come visit and uh, have a barbecue. So. Uh, Applications, if you have any connections to any high school students, including seniors who just graduated, um, applications are open until the 15th. Thanks. They can still apply. Ryla5150, R-Y-L-A 5150.org. And by the way, we have um, 
it used to be called Rotary Youth Leadership Awards, and nobody knew what that meant. So we've changed the A to Academy. So it's now the Rotary Youth Leadership Academy. And we'll have uh, the camp as part of that. We'll have uh, uh, projects and action community projects, you know, as part of that as well. Thank you, Lynn. Appreciate it. Excited. Let's go over some of the past events. I know we had a club social on May 25th, and I know Stacy was there. Would you like to talk about the social, Stacy? Who is in here today? Jim. Our, Jim has the mic. So on May 25th, we did a club social, which was an escape room, which was one of the things Mary really wanted to do. Um, so there was a small group of us because there were several people that had a COVID exposure right before uh, the event and they had to cancel. But um, you see, it was me, Mary, and Christopher. And um, given that Christopher and I had never participated in, a, in an escape room, you know, we think we were pretty proud of ourselves. We got almost to the end. We had two more puzzles to solve, and otherwise we would have completed it. But it was a lot of fun. I would highly recommend it. Um, and I just want to. Um, Thank everyone for attending all the social events over the years. This is um, after the picnic. I'm done with being the social chair, and Alicia is going to take over. So please support her. Give her any great ideas you have for social events. And um, but let me know if you have any questions. And hopefully see you guys at the picnic on Saturday. It says they almost escaped. Almost. <laughs> all right. On. Um, we had a, so we talked about the upcoming event for distribution of safety alarms. Uh, they had one on May 28th, and here are some pictures from this event. Uh, partnership with the same organizations and the same club as the event coming up. This is our president, Mary, in action. Um, this is uh, Mary, our president-elect, Christopher Wiseman, and Mary's husband, James. And these are the alarms they were giving away. This is a group photo in partnership with the Oakland Police Department and other Rotary Clubs in the East Bay. And this is the Asian seniors uh, learning about the instructions on how to use the alarm, which is also very important. And afterwards, um, our club, Rotary Club of San Francisco and Rotary Club of San Francisco Chinatown had some uh, delicious dim sum in Oakland. I had a chance, I think I was the only one there from our club to this Catholic Charities event on uh, June 4th. And this was a great event. We built hygiene kits uh, with stuff like toothpaste, toothbrush, body soap, uh, shaving blades, and snacks. I got to meet Darlene Wilson from Catholic Charities and she's just amazingly sweet. I had a great time. Uh, these are the backpacks that we put the hygiene kits in and it has our logo on it along with Catholic Charities. And it was a great opportunity for fellowship as well. Uh, made some new friends from San Francisco. And I think you've met some of these people. Uh, Victoria is, is a possible future member for our club and also her boyfriend, Jim. She was here about a month ago as a guest. And on um, yesterday, uh, there was an event at the ARC and drivers delivered prepackaged meals from the ARC of San Francisco to the families and Dan and Bob were there. Uh, Lance Scott was also there, and so was Chris Davies. Uh, we're gonna skip the table talk uh, just because of time. I hope that's okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Lynn, would you like to come up please to do the introduction? I think the... Uh... After listening to all of this, I think the new motto is not service above self, but Rotary never rests. <laughs> Rotary never sleeps. That's amazing. I'm very pleased to introduce Barry Posner. Um, we began working together uh, on the publication of the Leadership Challenge uh, book in 1987. So how's my math? Is that about 35 years ago, uh, which is amazing. Uh, the lead book is probably over 2 million copies sold at this point, uh, translated into many languages. Um, the framework and the work that, that came out of it was so special to me because it was, uh, for starters, it was accessible. Uh, and as Barry talks about, 
the work that they've come to around the five practices of exemplary leadership, uh, you will see and understand in your own life um, how they how they relate to what it means to be an exemplary leader. Um, I think you'll also understand why uh, we've selected it as an overarching framework for RILA and all of the youth leadership efforts that we do uh, in RILA and in uh, and in ELPS. Um, Barry has given so generously of his time. Uh, he actually came to Ryla camp uh, for three days with us a few years ago, um, offered a delicious critique of how we could uh, improve it. Um, and we are implementing a number of those uh, ideas as we come to Ryla this, uh, this August. Uh, please join me in welcoming Barry Posner. Yes, I think, yes, please, thank you. Thanks. So, <clears throat> Lynn, thank you for the introduction. I thought I would just uh, sit and chat with you for the next couple hours, <laughs> just to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> um, in, and in particular, in particular, I, I wanna share some ideas with you. Lynn asked me to, to speak mostly about how these ideas apply to the work that you're doing with youth. But I was struck by the you know, Rotary Never Rests, by all of the service projects that you're in, understanding that all of the things that I'm gonna, gonna share and apply, apply to all of us in our families, in the service work that you're doing, uh, in uh, voices for, American Voices, for, for all the organizations that, that, you're, that you're involved in. And, and our work begins uh, more than 30, almost 40 years ago, around a central question that Jim Kuzis and I began to ask people. We asked them to tell us about a time that they've been at their personal best as a leader. And for a moment, you might just think about that for yourself. Uh, that question asked you to think about that time. And, and then we ask sort of, so what were you doing? What happened at that time? What were the actions, the behaviors, the strategies, the things that you actually did? And it's, and it's been off that question that for more than 40 years, we've written a number of, um, let's see if this gets get this on. Uh, Well, while they're figuring out the technology, the next slide just shows you. The next slide just shows you. Next, next slide just, just shows you what I could have told you. And now we've been working for forty years. We've collected thousands of cases of. Uh, we've thank you, Jim. <clears throat> we've collected thousands of of cases uh, from from youngsters to senior citizens, from tall people to short people, from blue people to green people, from thick people, thin people, from people all over the world. And what we found is that there's a pattern of behavior, that there are some things that people are doing when they're at their personal best, and whether they're 13, 23, 33, 63, that there are, that there are some behaviors that actually matter when, it, when we talk about leadership. And they matter whether you're, you're working at ARC or you're working, uh, with the Asian community in, in Oakland around safety. You're working with prena prenatal care uh, homeless coalition. While well, you're working in Rotary. Uh, and these have been the basis then for books that we've written. Books for, if I can talk right into this, <laughs> you'll all be happier. Uh, so here's, 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 so what we find is that everybody's got a story to tell. And I want you to think about this if you were a scientist for a moment. Everybody we talk to has a story to tell about a time they've been at, a person, at their personal best. And you know, the 24 of us in the room would, would, have, would have a story to tell. 
And think about what's the implication if everybody I talk to, no matter where they are in the world, no matter whether they're from, from Turkey or India, uh, Egypt, wherever they are in the world, they have a story to tell about a time that they've been at their personal best. And when we ask them to tell us about some of the things that they've been doing when they were at their personal best, we find that there are some common action strategies, things that they're doing. So there's, there's a pattern. And if it's true, I mean, if you were a scientist for a moment and sort of said, well, everybody's got a story to tell and the things that they're telling are more similar than they are different. Well, what would you begin to sort of say that you'd learn about leadership? What you'd learn is that, first of all, it's, when the, it's within the capacity of everyone. It's not really a selection decision. It's really, it's really more of a liberation. It's, re, it's really trying to help people figure out what are the kinds of things that they care about that they want to make a difference about. You'd understand that leadership is something that's within the capacity of everyone. It's observable. It's learnable. You actually know it. You can, you can sort of say that's a leadership action. That's what people are doing when they're leading. And if you do those things, that's what it means to lead. And it doesn't make a difference where you are in the organization. When you look up the word leader, it's not in the dictionary, it's not capitalized. It doesn't refer to a position or a place in the organization. It's an attitude. And the word literally itself, the word literally itself comes from, from an, a Middle English word, lead in, which means to go, to travel, to guide. It's an action word. Leadership is about taking people to places they've never been before. And it's a wonderful contrast if you just, again, played with words for a moment and looked up the word management in the dictionary, and you'd see that it comes, it has, it has many origins, but think about its, think about the simplest origin, think about it in, in, in Spanish, manos, hands. Managers handle things. They get their arms around things, they hold on to things. And while there's some things to be accomplished by, by uh, all the economies of scale from doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, you know, all of the musicians in the room know that at the end it gets boring if you just do the same thing over and over and over again. So what is it that people are doing when they're at their personal best? Well, I want to tell you about those things, but, but I want to also suggest that as, as, Lynn's, as Lynn has mentioned, you, you know, <clears throat> We spent a lot of time being asked about leadership development programs and first consulting with Lynn about Ryla and some of the things that were going on reminded me of the work that we do on lots of different college campuses and in lots of corporations. And when somebody wants to do a leadership program, there are some things, there are some basic things that they ought to be thinking about. And I, and I, and I think Lynn understands this and the rest of you that have been working with Ryla in particular. It needs to be based upon a, some kind of a framework for all the things that we learn, for all of us that we learn things in school, or even when you learn how to be a Rotarian, there's a model, there's a framework. You don't just kind of make it up every year, you sort of start all over again. There's a, there's a way we do this. There's a way we, we, there's a way we be a Rotarian. You know, and, and, and this is what it means. And it, and it differentiates you from some other person or place or organization. So you need to have a framework. And, and the framework allows people then to have a place to come back to to try to understand what do I do when I'm dealing with an uncertain situation? How do I find my North Star? A good, a good framework ought to be based upon evidence, not just upon, you know, Lynn's personal philosophy or somebody's personal philosophy. President Mary has a philosophy this year, this is what Rotary should be, and then next year a new president will come and say, well, this is what I think Rotary should be. And, and while each of us ought to have an opportunity to, to individually, you know, add our mark, there are some basic foundations that just are not going to change. And they're evidence-based because they're proven that these are the things that make a difference if you want to have an effective chapter. And it ought to be something, when we talk about leadership, it ought to be something that that I want to say it ought to be something that's measurable because if you can measure it, then, then what you're really saying, it can be learned. You can sort of say, well, here's where I was at time one when I picked up the, the French horn. Here's where I was when I was at time one, and here's where I am at time two. And I can, and I can measure the difference between one and two, and that difference is called learning. If there is no difference, then it's just a habit. You keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And finally... A good framework ought to be, it ought to be accessible. It ought to be, 
It ought to be adaptable. It ought to be adaptable regardless of what high school you went to, what language you speak, uh, what your social economic status is, uh, how tall or short or thick or thin you are. Uh, it, it ought to be available and accessible for everyone so that everybody has their own opportunity to make a difference. So we, we call this eventually, after listening to all these stories, we came up with a model we call the five practices of exemplary leadership. I'm going to talk about each one of these just, just for a moment, then I, then I really want to just see if I can have a conversation. Model the way. When people told us about the times that they've been at their personal best, they talked about, they talked about leading by example. They talked about their own values and drive and commitment. And when we try to help students, young people in particular, but for all of the young people here in this room, I'd say the same thing. You need to help people clarify and articulate their personal values. The first question you need to ask yourself is the question that everybody else who, wants, who will eventually want to follow you must be able to, to answer, and that is, who are you? And if you can't answer that question for yourself, then there's no reason why anybody else would want to be in a relationship with you. And so in RILA, in Alps, and in, in other kinds of, of programs, we want to help people try and figure out sort of who am I? What's important to me? What really matters? Do, do I care about the climate? Do I care about homelessness? Do I care about what, what, what is it that I care about? I'd like to make a difference about. And then is to encourage people to provide greater intentionality between their values and their actions. Because when that doesn't happen, we have a word for that, it's called hypocrisy. And young people are particularly good at pointing that out, oftentimes from their mothers and fathers. You know. and, it is, and it is the notion, it is the notion of credibility. It's the notion of doing what you say you will do. It's the, it's the if you promised, if you promised Sonny you were gonna show up with that ice chest on Sunday, Saturdays, Saturdays. don't show up on Sunday. On Saturday, <laughs> On Saturday, he's counting on it. He's counting on it. And so, and so th that's true about the rest of us because partic particularly one of the things that, that's most important for people's engagement these days in the workplace is whether or not they trust their leader. And part of being able to trust your leader is that your leader's actions are consistent with whatever it is that he or she has to say. And it's also about inspiring a shared vision. Now, nobody, when, when they were at their personal best, no one said, to, said, I inspired a shared vision. But what they said was that they had to communicate, communicate, communicate. In, in real estate, it's location, location, location. But for leaders, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. And that sort of notion is that I, I've got to be repeating what it is that I think is important over and over and over again. And I've got to be reminding people so that they so that so that long after I'm gone, they can remember what it is we're about. And you think about that, think about that for, for Rotary. It doesn't make a difference whether you're in India or you're in Dallas. There are some principles. There ought to be, when you visit this club, there ought to be some things that you recognize and you think about how my club does that a lot better, or what it is that this club does <laughs> that we could learn from. That sense, that sense of of thinking about how you could breathe life so that people would want, that's what inspiration is, breathing life into people so that they could share your vision. And, and, and some strategies, and again, you, you'll, you'll see this if you look at the, the program for, for Ryla, getting people to focus more on the future, particularly, particularly a challenge for young people, but still the notion is to, to think about more than just what are you gonna do today, but what are you trying to do with your life? Where would you like to make a difference and how would you like to be remembered? And helping them to find the aspirations of others because in the end, it's not about, you know, Martin Luther King might have said, I have a dream, but in, but in the very next phrase he said, and in order for that dream to be achieved, we will have to struggle together, we will have to fight together, we will have to go to jail together, we will have to. And so every leader will have to have a dream but every leader will understand that it's not just about me, it's eventually going to be about us. And every parent here in the room understands that, or every child here in the room who grew up understands. I mean, some, sometimes my wife will say to me, you sound just like your father. This, this is usually not a compliment, but nevertheless, 
Nevertheless, it's those kinds of things that we remember, that we remember long after, in this case, mom and dad are, are gone. And it's about challenging the process. When we talk with people about their personal best, they never talked about doing something that they that's been done been done before or at least done in the same way. So, you know, every service project that you have, you, you know, they, some of them, they, they repeat, but every time they repeat, you're trying to ask yourself, well, how can we do this a little bit better next time? What did I learn this last time that would help me this next time? And maybe, maybe we ought to kind of, you know, move out of our comfort zone a little bit more and try some things that we haven't tried before. And we're going to try and do that, you know, at, at Riley, you know, you get people up on those high ropes kinds of activities, getting them out of their comfort zone to maybe put themselves in, in physically in a way that they hadn't thought that they were capable of doing. So you want to help people feel more comfortable while experimenting, where, where the focus is on learning. And particularly at Ryla, I think it's really important that the focus is on learning. It's not, it's not so much about kind of, you know, did, did you get the right answer? Or even I was thinking about, did you get out of the escape room? Really is what did what did you know what did you learn what did you learn so that next time you're in that escape room, uh, you'll be able to do much better than you did the last time. You learn some tricks, and so maybe the first time you don't get through it. And I think the other thing that's important is that oftentimes big projects, I mean Rotary's full of big projects, you know, going to change the world, but you're going to change the world one you know one one club at a time. You know, one club at a time is going to change is is going to change the world, and the collective action of one club at a time. And so, what we need to do with big projects is we need to break them into smaller pieces. So, all the young people who want to make a difference in the climate uh, about climate change, they're they're not they're not th their contributions will make a difference collectively. And so, we need to make sure that people can break this into into smaller pieces. You know, the the goal we worked with one young one youth organization a number of years ago whose whose goal was to plant you know plant trees because uh, there's all kinds of of, of 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 reasons reasons why for for climate change and uh and 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 so they started in one neighborhood uh but but within 10 years they had planted they had they had accomplished the planting of more than a million trees around the country simply because now there were something like 535 organizations at different high schools, all with the same kind of objective, to plant trees in their neighborhood. And it started with, it started with what, actually started with, with, a, with a young girl named Tara Church, who just simply, you know, was, was playing soccer one day and, and asked her mom about, you know, what's going to happen if, uh, if, the, if the world gets so, so smoggy and the pollution gets so bad that we can't play outside. And then she talked to the rest of her soccer team, and they decided that they could do something about this. And it's about enabling others to act. You know, we spend a lot of time on leadership development with young people and with old people, mature people. I, I was, saying, was saying to Lynn earlier that I find every year that there's more and more young people on the planet. Uh, at least personally, I find that to be the case. And, and you know, the, the truth is we spend a lot of time we spend a lot of time trying to help people become better leaders but we also need to be able to understand that you can't do it by yourself and so every time somebody talked about a time that they had been their personal best that it was not unusual that somebody would say would, would oftentimes even say you know Barry I can't tell you about my personal best because it wasn't me it was us you know and so at the end you know the end of the year President-elect nominee Sonny Singh is not going to be able to say, "Well, here's you know, here's what I did when I was president." He'll be able to say, "Here's what we did this last year while I was president," and it and and it helps when you can when leaders turn their followers into leaders, and they do that by giving people a chance to use their their talents. One of the most important things is that people feel more powerful when they get to make a choice, when they get to choose how they want to do something when they have some discretion. And if you ever called a call center, you know the difference between an organization where you call the call center and the person says to you, I can't do anything about that, as opposed to the call center employee who says, let me see what I can do about that, and then spend some time really trying to help you. And 
The other important thing is to try to help people learn how to listen more and talk less. I was reading, I was reading a novel recently about a magician and, and, and the author, every time, you know, one, one of the magical powers of the magician was that he was a good listener. I thought, well, that was great. I thought, and, and, and then the author, you know, capitalized listen every time to make sure that we realized this was a magical power. Well, I hope that each of us can learn, you know, learn more about that magical power of listening. And if you just think about it for a moment, whoever, you know, uh, you know, Patrick High Tech here, whoever designed this equipment gave us two ears and one mouth. And there must have been some intentionality in how we're supposed to use the equipment, right? I mean, it didn't, it didn't come with an instruction guide, but it just makes sense that somehow we ought to be listening more than just talking. And leaders also make sure that if you're going to ask someone to do something they've never done before, there's probably at least a, one of the reasons why they haven't done it before is because they don't think they can do it. And they're afraid. They're afraid they might be embarrassed. They might be hurt. Uh, uh, they're going to fire me if I do that. And so it's really important as leaders that we give people the courage. That's the root of the word encourage. To give them the courage. And not just the courage of the head, but the courage of the heart. To actually put themselves out and to do something that they didn't think that they could do. And most of us if not all of us, are bigger than our jobs. We, we can do more. We can do more than we've ever been asked to do. And so what we need to do to make sure as leaders is that we understand what motivates each of the people that we work with so that we can respond to them in ways that make a difference to them, whether it's a handshake, a pat on the back, a thank you note, public recognition here in the front of the room. What, what does that person need to know that so that they know that we appreciate what it is that they're doing and we value what it is that they've been doing. And, and then there's nothing, I think, nothing less expensive than just simply increasing the amount of thank yous. Uh, get, getting, you know, I have, like many of you, I got grandchildren, you know, and I'm still working on the five year old to say, please. You know, if you want something, just say, please. You can put it at the front of the sentence or at the end of the sentence, but I'm going to wait. That's the ma that's a magic word. And sometimes, sometimes he actually says it without prompting. And I'm going to hope that, you know, when he's six or 16 or 26 or long after I'm gone, he's going to he's he's going to forgotten how he learned to say, please, he's just going to say it because that's something that he should do. And he's going to get he's going to get more response when he can do that. Thank you as we're still working on. Um, but it doesn't. Call, it, it, it is the least. Ex, it is the. It is, it is the the least expensive thing we can do, is to simply show our appreciation for what somebody has done, expressed in with sincerity, <clears throat> not just uh, not just go, kind of going back to your offices today, going, "Hi everybody, I just came from a Rotary meeting and they said I should be nice to you, so <laughs> keep up the good work, whoever you are, whatever it is that you're doing." and I'll be back tomorrow. It's got to be done with sincerity, and the best kind of appreciation is personalized. It thanks the person for something specific that they did, not just a general thank you in the way that we sometimes throw away, how are you, and then don't even wait for an answer. That's my story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and, and see what you'd like to talk about. I'm going to I'm going to welcome our guest from from Dallas. You go first. Yeah, um, so I uh, listened to a podcast last week and the guest was um... So I was uh listening to a podcast last week and the guest uh her name is uh, Susan Kane uh, and she writes a book on the power of introverts and bittersweetness and as you were talking it made me think of the podcast cuz one of the, her comments in the podcast was society as a whole organizations as a whole even schools condition children to think that they have to be an extrovert extrovert to be a leader just was curious your thoughts on that and how we as rotarians or we as society can change that perspective because there, there are so many introverts that are either scared or anxious about coming to organizations like rotary and speaking up within their organizations
Can he, he, you want to try this one? I, I feel like that magician who somehow is, is, is corrupting all the technology here in the, here in the room. I, I, started, I started to say, first of all, I appreciate all of Susan Cain's work. I think, I think she points out we don't always appreciate kind of what it means to be an introvert. Um, but, I but, I will, but I will say this, and I don't, and I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm arguing with her. If, if we don't know what you're thinking, then we don't know that we might want to think alike. You, if, I don't, if I don't know what you'd like to do, then I can't, I can't be with you. And so we really have to help people find their voice. Um, but that voice can be, it can be a soft voice, it can be a loud voice, but part of, part of answering the question of kind of who am I is to get enough confidence that in fact, when somebody says to you, so, uh, Ryan, I'm, I'm just, I'm just looking to kind of see if you're married yet, just looking for a ring, because I was going to say, you know, if you, any of you remember when you were dating and, and you wanted to go out and you'd sort of say to the other party, so what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. You know, until somebody's willing to, to put themselves out and say something, you can't have a relationship. So I think that what we're trying to do, particularly with young people, but young at any age, is to try to help people figure out what it is that they care about and we find we find that if you if you ask somebody about something that they care about they end up being very expressive they act just like extroverts ask somebody about the vacation that they've just been on and you you wouldn't know if they were an extrovert or an introvert because because if it was a good one they're going to tell you about it and they're going to tell you about it in such a way that you wish you were there and uh I think what I think her contribution has been to suggest that you don't have to be what, whatever we think whatever we think extroverts are. Um, so, sir, I'm gonna I'll I'll walk back here because we, we we the microphone works. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thank you, Barry, for a nice presentation. Um, I just want to say that. Uh, Many years ago, in the early 2000s, I had the opportunity to read your book when I was a Kaiser Permanente employee. And at Kaiser Permanente, I, which most of us know, installed the largest electronic medical record in the United States. It's the largest HMO with the largest EMR, which is based out of Madison, Wisconsin. The long and short of it is they challenged us. And I remember reading the book and being challenged uh, from the leadership challenge and, and using the techniques that we were taught. Now, as a youth facilitator for Ryla slash Alps, um, I'm using those skills and it is wonderfully fascinating to see these kids, the youth, shine and develop. And my lesson is I have to pause a little bit because you, you want to you wanna help encourage, but you want to let the kids do their thing. And that's what we had to do. So I'm learning those lessons and uh, thank you for your book. By the way, that was, I think, edition three or four. What, what edition are you on now? So <laughs> th this, is a, this is edition number six, which I've autographed to give to Jim, as I understand one of the patriarchs of Ryla here um, and we just but we just Jim and I just finished turning in the manuscript for the seventh edition which will be published in January so I'm dating myself you can figure that it's, edition out <laughs> it's it's fine thank you I, I have a question yes. um, sorry. Uh, it, and thank you for your presentation um, I over the years I've been a volunteer for 40 years and I've been retired. I retired from my last formal board about a year ago. And as most people that want to become a leader, you want to develop leadership to follow your footsteps in any organization. And from your role as a professor working with youth and, and new upcoming generation of leaders, have you seen some areas that we need to work on? Because I found this really deep generational issue of communication 
and you said leadership requires communication. And with all the social media and, and actually young people not talking to each other, texting, not even calling their girlfriends on the telephone, which is supposed to be really not you know etiquette anymore. I really, I think myself personally, have had some communication issues with people in their 20s and 30s, quite frankly. I don't know if there's 30 year olds in the room, but in terms of, yeah, no, seriously, and not to be disrespectful, but I think we've all been raised and groomed and educated in a fashion where my generation, we had to talk if we wanted to be heard, okay? And I learned that much later in life, in my 40s as a woman, to have a voice. So um, maybe you could share, I mean, have you seen some progress, change? Because on a very practical level, I've led about five organizations. My most challenging was the last one. I led a preventive healthcare program here in the city. And I actually convinced people to hire an executive coach to help the next leadership person to be successful, and I wanted to see that. But I felt that I wasn't able to give enough, and the other people on the board weren't able to give the director enough experience you know, to, to really do a good job. Okay. <laughs> more, <laughs> well, I like <laughs> more, more, more than more than more than one question. So, so let me let me let, let me let me ram, let me ramble back a, a moment or two. Then, yeah. um, I, I find that I find that for my undergraduates at Santa Clara University, I'm still on, still on the faculty, chairing our our management department. I I find that. Um, that, that we have to really we have to really encourage we have to really encourage students to um, to use what you would call old fashioned media like talking to people like calling them on the telephone like not just assuming that you sent them a text and 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 they got it and so you have to do you have to do more um, that's one two it's interesting that um, that the research actually suggests that those people who are young people who are on who are who are most involved on social media actually have more relationships than people who are not on social media. So so social media is actually encouraging people to in, to increase their network. And, and here's one interesting sidetrack. You know, we have almost almost a, a third of of marriages these days are people who met online. So so. Um, put that put that away somewhere. <laughs> Just in terms of in terms of communications. I mean, people people are able to make make connections with people that they that don't live in their neighborhood. They don't, you know, and and particularly when you can work from anywhere now, this is probably going to become even more prevalent. We're going we're going to a, a wedding this uh, this summer of some former undergraduates now about five or six years years ago. Neither one of them has a physical workplace that they work from anymore, uh, so they have. So I, I don't think they have any fr friends from work that are coming to this this wedding. Uh, that that's that's not a place not not a place that people are are connecting in the same way that they that they used to be able to. We'll have to see kind of where where that goes. What from from a from a, a leadership a leadership perspective, I would still come back to the notion is. Is that you have to help people figure out, and, and this is what, gosh, in my own classes, but I, th I think an important part of Ryla is trying to help, is trying to help, and, and I should really sort of say, and I would do this as, as an executive coach, is really trying to help people get comfortable expressing what's important to them, and then being willing to talk about it a lot, and to what we call it kind of telegraph your moves. Let people know you made this decision or took this action because you had this value, because you appreciate how important this is, it's what you said, therefore, that's why I called you, that's why I showed up, that's why I did these, these kinds of things, making that connection much, much more explicit. And you can do that, Ryan, whether you're a, an introvert or an extrovert in terms of, in terms of personality. Um, f fi finally, I, I think you're finding that... Um, that if that if we're open to it, uh, young people can teach 
older people in the workplace some new things and older people in the workplace can teach younger people some new things. I think uh, as, as your comment, you know, when, when we have a chance to work with some younger people, we actually find ourselves really, I, I find myself mostly impressed with, with, the young, with young people at, at, at our university. Um, I'm, 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 impressed with, I'm impressed at times with their naivety, but I'm also impressed with their energy, with, with their spirit. Um, the challenge that we have today is, and it's a, it's a, it's a much bigger topic, I think, um, you know, talk about kind of, we've, we've lost really not the art of communication, we've lost the art of compromise, lost the idea of collaboration. Um, you know, and that's, that's, that's the sense where it can't just be, I have a dream, it can't just be my way or the highway. Otherwise, you know, n neither of us get on the road again. And that's, and that's, that's not a, I, I don't think that's necessarily a generational issue because it's, it's, you, you see that, you see that <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, you see that, you know, you see that at the gangs at, you know, the, the, the kids at schools too, who are, who are in tribes. Um, and hard, harder to find commonality. Sorry, so just, uh, yeah. Uh, Barry, we have a question from online, uh, Professor Chen. Okay, um, I'm Professor Chen. Thank you for your speech. I have uh, two simple questions. What is the, you know, the big, uh, most uh, big difference between the good leader and the bad leader? And what is that your most common mistake the leader makes? Thank you. Well, good, good questions as if they have an easy answer. Uh, good, um, good, good leaders develop other leaders. Uh, you know, bad, bad leaders, bad leaders don't, don't, don't. And in that case, in that case, I, I wouldn't even necessarily talk to call them leaders. Uh, only I'd use that term if I were talking about it from a position. You know, what's a good general manager and what's a bad general manager? Or what's a good CEO or what's a bad CEO? And I talk about kind of how they, the good ones build the capacity of, of the people that, that work with them and for them. Um, and, and the ones who are what you call bad or less effective are the, are the ones who, who, may do, who may do great things, uh, but they don't last very long. Um, they're really, a, you know, kind of a cult of a personality. So that was the first question, good and bad. And the second question, what's the, what's the most important thing the leader needs uh, to do? What's the most common mistake the leader, uh, leader make, the leaders make? Um, the, the most, the common, the, the most common mistake is hubris, is pride, is thinking, is, is, is believing that you're great. Uh, believing that you're better than other, I mean, the, the downfall, the downfall through history has always been of people who, uh, you, you know, it's not so much the power corrupts, but it's just that you believe that you're smarter than everybody else, uh, that that the rules don't apply to you. Um, that you uh, I could, <laughs> <laughs> and and we all probably have exa can think of examples from history. <laughs> Or in relationships that we have, but you know, part of, part of that. So, the, so the other the, the antidote to that, the antidote to that is that I think that the, that the best leaders are the great learner, are the best learners. Think about Rotary as as one opportunity for that. Is is that the more interest we are in learning keeps us open to new information, keeps us more humble, keeps us more interested in thinking that we don't know everything, and there are things that we could learn and people we could learn from. And I think that's 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 the antidote to uh, to arrogance and uh, and hubris. Thanks for the question. Sonny's giving me the look. No, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. And as a big thank you uh, for being here today, we'll be uh, inoculating hundred children against polio in your name. Thank you so much. Before we ring the bell, I have, we have a special guest joining us from Houston, President Mary Lou. Would you like to uh, say a few words, please? Hi, 
Hi, everybody. I'm here with Jessica Hansen. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. And I'm in her Alliance for Smiles booth. We've been here. I'm going to take you on a quick tour. I'm at the House of Friendship. You guys have to come next year when we get to Australia. Here we go. Can you see it? Oh, so you can learn everything about Rotary. You've got all the vendors here and you can speak to all the Rotarians and meet people from all around the world. I've met a group of Ugandians, everybody from the Philippines, Kenya. So it's a lot of fun. Wish you were here. I will see you in Australia next year. Thanks, Sunny, for a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. All right. So that is the end of the meeting today. Thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to try this one more time here. There you go. <laughs> please uh, stay after for fellowship. And a quick reminder, if you did sign up for potluck, please see Stacy Poole before you leave. Thank you.